So yeah, we're studying the book of Colossians, which we'll do for about nine weeks. It's a pretty phenomenal book, if you ask me. It's one of my favorite books of Scripture, only four chapters, so it's not long. Um, but the reason why we're studying the book of Colossians is that I believe that the church is at a crossroads. I think that the church, and I'm not talking about just Crosswalk or just the Seventh-day Adventist church, I'm talking about Christianity in general. Christianity in general is searching for an identity as the world changes and as it changes. And some people really identify with the left. Some people really identify with the right. Some people want to be progressive and move forward. Some people want to be sort of regressive and move back to the better days and the good old days and how it was. But this series is really about how there is really only one way. And it's not about back or forward, left or right. It is about one thing, and that is Jesus. And Jesus defies direction. He defies party affiliations. He is something wholly other. And the truth is, if the church does not reorient itself and become Christological at its very core, we have no future as a faith because we are believing in the wrong things. In order to faithfully represent Jesus in our time, it means that we must not only get to know him again, but then represent him to the world with a new language, with new art, with new music, and with a new understanding of who he is. You see, people are confused about Jesus. It used to be that they didn't understand his humanity. They knew he was God, but they didn't understand his humanity. Now we have people who think he was a great guy, but they don't understand his divinity. It's time for a new discovery of who Jesus is. But in the midst of that, that also means that we have a representing of Christianity as well and what it really is. So let's ask the question, what is Christianity? Christianity is one thing, and one thing only, no more, no less. Christianity is Christ. It's not an ideology. It's not a philosophy. It's not a worldview. It is the person, God, Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is. If it becomes something about something else, it is no longer Christianity. It is something holy and completely different, and we cannot allow for that. So this is our manifesto, and this is Paul's manifesto that we will be studying. You see, a manifesto is a public declaration of policy or aims. This is the definition of it, right? Especially, they, they have a tendency to be a manifesto that's issued before like a, a political party or an election or something like that, but this is Paul's manifesto. He says, listen, this is what I believe. This is Paul's line in the sand, this is his, uh, his this I believe sort of statement. And here's the thing. We are Christ's manifesto in the world. You and I were meant to be living manifestos, living epistles, living letters to the world about how much God loves us. We were set apart and supposed to be cities on a hill, salt and light to the world. Our lives are that declaration of who God is. But what are we declaring? See, this is why we do biblical work. It's, see, it's, it's interesting. For, at La Sierra University, for quite a few years, I used to do um, during their, I don't know if it was Ignite or Jumpstart, all the different colleges have a different program when you bring your freshmen in. And they come in a week before and they take all these classes. And they used to have me come in and speak to the students about sex. That was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. They were like, you did take on sex. And I was like, okay. And so I had an 11-point talk that I gave. It started with sex is fun. Because <laughs> it is. And um, it said a lot of other things, too. One of the things I said, one of the points was that sex always declares something. It always says something. So you got to be clear on what it is that you're saying when you have sex with someone. Our lives declare something. Our lives declare something. They are a letter about what we are and who we believe in. Make sure that we understand what it is we're declaring. And this is why we do the biblical work. Right? This is why every day we're in Scripture. Every day we're reading these texts. Every day we are learning about who Jesus is. And the book of Colossians is a phenomenal exposition and revelation of who God is. In fact, this letter is the model of divine revelation in all of the New Testament. Paul uses words in this book he doesn't use anywhere else. And he does that because he wants us to see a Jesus that we haven't maybe seen before. And his words hold up 2,000 years later. This is the high water mark. We see Christ more clearly in the book of Colossians than we see him in any other of Paul's letters. And it was needed. 
It was needed because the Colossians had become distracted from who Christ was. And I wonder if your Christianity looks like that too, or if mine does. Does your Christianity look like that? Does it look distracted? Because by the way, if it looks distracted, like if you've turned your head away from Christ, guess what? You're sinking, if you remember the story of Peter. Like you will not survive. You will drown in all the rest of what the world wants you to be or needs you to be or thinks that you are. If we are not focused on Christ, clearly, if we're not declaring Him with our lives, we are doing something wrong, and the Colossians had become distracted. They had dethroned Christ. They had denied His supremacy and lost track of His sovereignty over their lives. Have we done that? Have we become distracted and found that the church is about something else? It's about my likes or my dislikes. It's about my fellowship. It's about all those things. They can all be great. But in the end, it has to be a declaration of Christ or we are, or we have no business doing what we do. So the question we have to ask in this, in this, in this book is how does Paul introduce them again to Christ, but also how does he introduce them, himself to them? How does he address them? And then how does he correct them? Because there's some issues and there's a reason why he's writing this letter. So we're going to jump into the text so we can see how Paul handles. Now, here's the thing about the church in Colossae. That church was a young church young in belief and also young in age. They were a young group of people, which means they had a ton of energy, right? Young people have tons of energy. My son will come to me at nine o'clock at night and go, dad, will you take me to the skate park? I want to go skating. I'm like, well, it's nine o'clock. And he's like, yeah, what? I'm like, at night, I'm going to bed. And he's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I'm old and tired. And he's like, "Uh, I'm just getting started with my day. Young people have a lot of energy, and the church in Colossae had a lot of energy. It had a lot of young people that wanted to do great things, but it was listening to other people who were distracting them from Christ. They were preaching a gospel. Well, they were preaching an almost gospel, an almost Jesus. So let's jump into the text. We'll be reading from the New Living Translation. You can read from whatever translation you like, um, but it starts like this, Colossians 1.1. This letter is from Paul chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Why did he say that? He said that because he always had to convince people that he was an apostle even though he hadn't been a disciple. It was important that he let them know that the reason why they needed to listen to him was because the will of God chose him. And so he says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. Now, who's Timothy? Timothy was his ward. Timothy was his apprentice, if you will. In this young man, he saw great potential. He knew he would be next. And so he wanted to introduce him to the churches so that Timothy would have a career. Here's an interesting, it's it's an interesting precedent. Every Christian should have an apprentice that they are growing into the faith. Not just your kids, other people as well. You should have somebody that's younger than you that you are growing in faith that is becoming accountable to you and you are helping and you become accountable to them, helping to grow them so that this thing we call Christianity, this faith we have in Jesus continues. But then he continues on in his writing in verse 2 where he says, we are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God, our Father, give you grace and peace. And as we know from the book of Romans, when Paul says grace and peace, what he is recognizing is that there are both Gentiles and Jews in the church, and he wants to welcome them all there. But I wonder, have you ever been called holy? Have you ever been called saints? I'm writing to God's holy people. Have you ever been called saints? In the work, us pastors, every once in a while, we call you all our congregants saints. And it usually sounds something like this. Oh, the saints, they're not going to let us do it. (laughs) So it's a little sarcastic. I apologize. But then Paul says this. He goes, listen, we always pray for you and give thanks to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Reputation. We've heard your reputation. We know that you are doing some amazing things. I wonder, what is your reputation? In fact, let's be more specific. Not just what is your reputation, what is your spiritual reputation? Do the people around you know that you are a man or a woman of God? Do they know that you are a lover and follower of Jesus Christ? 
Or is that something that, that they wouldn't necessarily know about you? Now, that doesn't mean that you get weird in the way that you express that, but are you living a life in a way that they know this person is completely sold out to who Jesus Christ is? Do you know what your reputation is? And is it true? But let's ask the corporate question. What is Crosswalk's reputation? And I think this is super important. What are we all doing individually to forward the reputation of Crosswalk as a community of Christ? Because I'll tell you what, I don't want Crosswalk to be known as the cool church or the church with the lights or the church with the coffee. I don't care about that. I want Crosswalk to be known as the church who loves Jesus more than anybody around. That's what I want this church to be. So what are we doing to build the reputation of Crosswalk? But really, we're building the reputation of Christ. That's the question we have to ask. But he's praying for them. He's excited for them. He knows them. And he says, listen, this reputation, it comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had expectation. You've had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Do you know that God's, God's reserving things for you in heaven? God has things for you in heaven. He's not really a hoarder. It's not like that. But he's got things that he has reserved for you, and they are in heaven. What are some of the things? One of the things is joy. He's got joy for you. Now, remember, let's delineate between joy and happiness, right? You can be, you can be very unhappy and still be filled with joy. You can be going through a very difficult thing, a very rough thing, and still be filled with joy, right? Because joy, the source of joy is from heaven. The source of happiness, well, happiness can be annoying. We all know that, right? Some people are just too happy, <laughs> and especially at bad times, Right? So I've got a daughter who would wake up like, morning! And I got a 13 year old who wakes up like, morning? That's hard to live with together. He thinks she's annoying. She can't figure out why he's not happier for the day. Joy transcends all those things. Right? Joy transcends all those things. Then the other thing that God is storing up for you in heaven, according to scripture, is faith. That's interesting. You ever wonder if you're still going to have faith when you get to heaven? I mean, faith is this, like, we, we hope we have faith in God, but then we get to heaven and he's there. Do we still have faith? Yeah, of course we do. Of course we do. And by the way, faith comes from God. And here's the beautiful thing. That faith that he's storing up in heaven seems to be accessible here. The joy that he's storing up in heaven seems to be accessible here. The last thing that God is storing for you, storing up for you in heaven, it's hope. Hope that heaven has for us is palpable. And you know what? It's crazy because we live it here on earth. Matthew 6.10 says it, right? On earth as it is in heaven. If all that is for you in heaven, then all that is accessible to you here on earth. This is all can be yours. Amen? Yeah, this, this, this stuff that God promises you, he's actually a promise that he makes for you now. And I don't, I don't get, I don't understand why Christians too often are just waiting for the end. Like we can't wait for the end because then it will all be perfect. God has given you the kingdom right now, right here, today. So there's no reason you can't live as if you're in heaven right now, here, today. And you're like, oh, no, but my life is horrible. Guess what? God is with you through that horribleness. That's a piece of heaven, right? This is, this, oh, I, things aren't working out the way I want them to work out. Oh, you know what? Deal with it. God's with you. You'll be okay. Even in the hardest stuff, God has decided he would be with you. But too many of us are like waiting. We're like in the waiting room of life, waiting for, for heaven to start. That denies what God has promised us already. Don't do that. And then Paul continues on. The same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. And I love this, right? He says the same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. Why do I love it? Because this is an, an ascent to the fact that they are not just involved in, in one local thing. They are involved in a Holy Spirit movement that is changing the world. They are involved in, a, in something that will change the course of history, that will change thought in, in particular. It will change everything. The whole world will actually mark its calendar, at least the whole Western world at this point, marks its calendar by this guy, Jesus. You see, it's easy to say, oh, I belong to Crosswalk Church. I'm part of Crosswalk Church. But here's my question. Is Crosswalk Church just a church or is it a movement? Are we part of the movement 
I hope that we're part of the movement. Oh, one thing I didn't tell you. Um, I, I meant to do this, actually. We have another church that's jumping in on this series, Remix Church in Clinton, Massachusetts. And they're joining us for this series, which is awesome. Right? I actually kind of believe we're part of a movement. God is doing something through Crosswalk and through this form of Christianity that he's giving us. Praise God for that. It's growing. But this is what he says. Like, listen, you're not just a church in Colossae. You're actually part of a much greater movement. If we can go back to that slide, because I didn't finish up that text, um, that'd be great. He says, he says you know, we are, we are part of this movement. If we go back to 1-6, that'd be awesome. Let's go backwards one way. Thank you. Um, and then he says, listen, this, this movement, it's bearing fruit everywhere. By, well, how? By changing lives. Just as it changed your life from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You know what God's wonderful grace is? God's wonderful grace is this, that he couldn't love you more, that he couldn't possibly love you more. The creator of the universe, the one who holds the stars in his hands and hung them in the sky, that entity could not love you more. Not because you're so great, but because he is so great. And that grace is available to you right now. You can live as if you live in the kingdom of God because you do, because he has seen fit to give that through his son, his death and his resurrection. He has seen fit to give that to every single person. If you don't know what that is, that's what it is. And that should invigorate you. That should change your life because you have a hope that other people don't have. I was just speaking at a, at a healthcare convention for healthcare professionals, and it was a faith-based healthcare professional convention, right? And, and I said, you know what? I don't actually like that term faith-based because it sounds like that's where we came from. I like the term faith-driven healthcare. And I made the case this. Listen, I don't think you're actually in the same business as a for-profit healthcare system. And of course, they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, yeah, you give health care, but that's not the business that we're in when we're faith-driven. The business that we're in when we're faith-driven is hope, something that transcends everything else. We, give an inc- we get to give an incredible grace. And I, say, I always say this to healthcare professionals. I say, you know, you lose all your clients. You know that, right? Like, there's no healthcare system that's beaten death yet. Like, you will lose all your clients. Maybe not the day they come in. Hopefully not the day they come in. But eventually, you'll lose all your clients. You guys are in a, 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 like a, a desperate fight against death, and death always wins. But faith-driven healthcare is different. Because faith-driven healthcare recognizes that we'll lose, but we've won. We'll lose, but there's hope. So even at the very end of life, I was, talking to, I was talking to nursing students yesterday at Azusa Pacific University. Even at the end of life, when everything is over and these people are dying, you still get to give them hope. A hope that transcends the death that's about to happen. A hope that comes from the grace of God and what he did on the cross and how he, how he was raised from the dead. And all of that changes everything. And this is what he's saying. Paul is saying, listen, your lives are changed completely. You're bearing fruit everywhere because of this movement of grace. And then he says this, you know what? You learned about the good news from this dude named Epaphras. And then he goes, he's our beloved coworker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. Now, who is this guy? We don't really know much about him. He's mentioned a couple other times, but that's it. But I love what Paul says, because you know what this tells us? This tells us that Paul is not jealous of somebody else giving the gospel. You ever wonder why churches are jealous of each other? Churches do that, right? They look, over, they look over their shoulders and they go, oh, that church is doing pretty well. I wonder what that's going to mean for our community. <laughs> because people do that. You guys move around. Like sometimes, and sometimes that's fine. Like sometimes, sometimes you've been at a church long enough and you need a new experience of Christ, so it's time to move. I get that. I want you to understand that. Like if you go, oh, I've been a crosswalk for a while. It's time. I need a new expression. Cool. I get that. You need to go where God's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. But for some reason, we in today's church look over each other's shoulders and get really nervous when somebody else is doing well. Paul didn't have that situation. Paul's situation was, hey, you learned about, you learned about the gospel from Epaphras? That guy's awesome. I love that dude. That's so great. And now he's helping us because of you. Praise God for that. And he has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. You know that all the love that we have comes from God, right? Every time we love, that is an expression of who God is. And that love that, over, that, that effervesces from us, that love that overflows from us, all of that comes from the Holy Spirit. And here's the beautiful part. He's got a lot. So if you need to love, 
you're not gonna, it's not gonna run out. Like if you feel like you know somebody who needs love, you can go give them all the love that they need and that love will continue to come out because it is an overwhelming, never-ending spring or wellspring of love. So here's my question. Do you pray for more love for those around you? Because everybody needs more love. Every time somebody says the church is irrelevant, that just means the church isn't loving. That's what that means. Because yes, if the church is trying to convince you that we're right, then we become irrelevant pretty quick. But if the church is trying to love, we will never be irrelevant because there will never be enough love in the world. And the moment we start to die, it's because that's the moment we stopped loving. So we can't do that. Verse 9, it says, and we're only going to verse 10 today. Verse 9 says, so we have not stopped praying for you since the first we heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. I love the consistency of prayer here. We have not stopped praying for you. You know, sometimes you got to pray for people for a long time. Sometimes you got to pray for a long time and you don't know why. You're like, why isn't God answering my prayer? That's not actually the right question. The question is, am I faithful in continuing to pray and then continuing to, to do the work that God is calling me to do? I've, had, I've been here five years now. And, and I've had stories of people coming in saying, listen, I've been praying for my friend for three years. He's coming next week. And, and, and they're wondering, like, why did it take three years? Well, you know what? God's time is different than yours. And so Paul says, we've not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. Don't stop praying for people. And he says, we're praying for three specific things. And it's fascinating how he's doing this because he's laying the foundation for what they need to know. He says, we pray for the knowledge of God's will for you. Right? This is the knowledge of God's will, of what the church, what the church is, what, the, what they should be doing in Colossae, what the church means to the world. Right? He said, we want you to understand the will of God for your church, and so we pray for that specifically. And then he says, we also pray for wisdom, but he doesn't just say wisdom, does he? He says spiritual wisdom. Now, what is spiritual wisdom? We just spent a lot of time in Proverbs. So we kind of know what practical wisdom is. We know some of that. But this is specific. He says we're praying for spiritual wisdom, for spiritual discernment. You know what that is? Spiritual discernment is the ability to understand when somebody is giving you the gospel almost and it's not right. That's spiritual discernment. And see, what had happened in Colossae is that these preachers had come in and they had been preaching an almost gospel but not, not quite gospel. And the, and the young people in Colossae were struggling with that. They were taking it as the gospel. By the way, that still happens in church today. People almost preach Jesus. It sounds good, but it's not quite right. And what we've done, and this is unfortunate, and we should never do this as congregants. We should never allow our teachers and preachers to do our believing for us. Right? Because then you'll just accept anything that's there. You shouldn't let your doctrines do your believing for you. You shouldn't let your traditions do your believing for you. You should wholeheartedly take responsibility for what you believe so that when you hear something that's not quite the gospel, you go, "Uh uh-uh, no. That's close, but you're not there yet. Go a little further. Listen, God loves you, but he wants to make sure you do this or that. No, 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 wait a second. That's not grace. That's contingency. Grace says, I am loved by God. I am accepted by God, and God died for me. And that is a free gift that I get to receive. So if it is a Jesus and or a Jesus but or a Jesus maybe, you've got a problem. And the problem is that when we do that, when we accept what other people say, we lose the ability to have spiritual discernment. Listen, sometimes I say things and people hear them differently than was my intent. I understand that. And, and every once in a while, and I love it when this happens, when somebody comes to me and says, hey, can I make an appointment, whatever, or send me an email and say, Pastor, did you, is it, did you say this? Because that's what I heard. And I'm like, oh, uh, and I'll go back and I'll actually go look and say, you know what, I said, I understand how you thought I said, that's not what I meant. I'm sorry if that's how you took it. Because sometimes I'll actually say exactly what I mean and you'll hear exactly what you wanted to hear. Which is what we do, right? It's okay. It's what we do. Like, I'm, I'm not angry at you, and hopefully you're not angry at me. Um, but to have that, I love it when someone goes, oh, because that, that, that was strange to me. I wasn't sure. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is what I meant. Okay, okay, all right. We're back on the same page. Okay, that's a cool. I love those conversations. Those are great. And I love them when they're given in a spirit of joy. I don't like it when somebody's really mad at me because they heard something they think that I said. That's a different conversation. 
But, but your ability to spiritually discern what I'm saying is important for you as a person of faith. So don't ever lose that, please. The last thing they said they pray for is understanding, spiritual wisdom and understanding, right? This is how we reflect and interact with others and what, uh, about what they need. This is how we listen and about how they, what they need and how they work. You know, we pray for that understanding because this keeps us away from, from the misunderstandings that often happen in faith. <clears throat> and, and these three things, I'm going to cough one second, excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you. I say that for Ernie, our sound guy, not for you, so that I don't cough in all of your faces. Um, so, so we pray for this understanding. We pray for knowledge to understand who God is. We pray for wisdom, spiritual wisdom, so that we can discern when it's not quite right. And we pray for understandings to make sure that we're listening. He was praying for this for the church in Colossae because they were having problems. They were listening and not spiritually discerning, and that's a problem. And so he wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. And then he says this, listen, then the way you live, when you have these things, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow and learn to know God better and better and better. Now, I love that he said this because what he's doing, what Paul is doing is he's laying the foundation. He's laying the foundation to refocus them on Jesus. And it's fascinating because in Romans, what he did is he's like, hey, grace and peace to you. And then he begins to hammer them on sin and he hammers them on sin. But he doesn't do that to the Colossians because they couldn't handle it. So what he says is, listen, I love what you guys are doing. I think it's great. It's beautiful. You're getting a little bit distracted. Let me paint a picture for you that won't allow you to be distracted. You see, what had happened is they domesticated Jesus. They had lowered him from his throne. They had taken him down. It's like this. It's the difference between, it's the difference between your pet cat and a lion. Right? Work with me here. Let's say you're in your front room, right? You're in your living room, and a lion walks across walks around the corner. I think you will be less distracted by that lion. All of a sudden, you're like, What's happening? And the lion's looking at you like, what's going on? You're going to keep your eyes on that lion until that lion walks out of your house. Now, I don't know why there's a lion in your house. Maybe you live in Uganda. I have no idea. But there's a lion in your house. You will not get distracted from that lion. You will be laser-like focused on that lion because why? You don't want to die. Listen, I got two cats. I got two little, I got cats. They are not in any way, shape, or form intimidating. They just walk around. I run into them sometimes because I'm so not paying attention. See, that's what they had done with Jesus. Is they had dethroned him. They brought him down. They domesticated him so much to the point that he wasn't really God anymore. And so, you know what? Because of that, you know, fruit stops growing because we're not focused in the right way. And we start to express our faith in these things in lots of different ways. I got one question for you today. Before I get to it, I just want you to know the next few weeks are going to be phenomenal. <laughs> Not because they're brilliant sermons. It's, they're going to be phenomenal because of the words that Paul begins to put on to Jesus to explain who he is. He goes, listen, I need to paint for the Colossians. I need to paint a picture that is so big, it covers their horizons so they can't look away. And then he goes, you know what? I think I'll use, I'll use the universe because then they won't be distracted anymore. They won't be able to turn their heads because God will be everywhere once I lay the picture out of who Jesus really is. That's what we get to in the next few weeks. So I'm so grateful that we get to go on this journey together because we get to discover and rediscover who God is and then we get to represent him to the world. And in that way, we redefine Christianity so that people understand Christianity is nothing more or nothing less than Jesus Christ himself. And if it becomes something else, we are doing damage to his good name. And we don't want to do that. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God of grace, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being a God who's worthy of all the words that Paul puts to you. Lord, thank you that he cared enough to write a letter to this church that struggles with some of the same things that we struggle with as well. And thank you for his grace and the way that he deals with them. May you be as graceful when you deal with us. Lord, we are so grateful for your kindness. We're so grateful for your love for us. And we are so excited that you are the God of the universe. So thank you. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.